Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. Fragrant gardening is something that is becoming, I think, even more popular, mainly because our lifestyles are so busy and you know, if we can extend the pleasure that we get from our gardens, maybe even into the evening when we can't see them, see it, but we can still smell it. Well, that's, you know, another plus for adding fragrance to the, uh, our garden areas that we have. So what I've done with this program, and first I'd like to also make a disclaimer that this is my first Zoom presentation. So um, please just bear with me. It's a little hard. And I like the interaction with the, with an audience, but also um, I went into horticulture so that I would not have to talk to people. I, um, I much prefer uh, just communing with the plants and, you know, lo and behold, I get this job as horticulture manager and I'm required to give presentations and, and talk to human beings and it's not my forte. So if you'll just bear with my stumbling efforts and we'll get through this. But what I've done with this program is I've tried to incorporate all four seasons and give the um, participants or people, people watching or attending at this presentation um, certain ideas that they could, or certain plants that they could incorporate into their garden in each season to make it a year round, um, give a year round sense of fragrance. All right. so. In the wintertime, this slide is showing on the left fragrant winter sweet, Chimonyphus praecox. Um, it is, as far as appearance wise, kind of a nondescript shrub. We have it in the garden at Hills and Dales in the church garden, and it's in the very back. It's not really noticed that much. The, um, the blooms aren't very showy. But what we love about it is that it permeates the air in January. If you have a balmy, kind of warm day in January, that scent from the winter sweep will permeate the air in the church garden. And it's so welcome to you know, smell or to get, catch that odor in the dead of winter. Now, it's not reliably hardy, nor much colder than zone seven. But Cobb County is zone seven, so you should be able to grow it just on there. And, you know, I will say that ours is perfectly hardy. It seems to be very, very hardy for us. What will happen is if it's in full bloom and you get a hard freeze, it may zap the blooms, but the shrub is not harmed at all. But, you know, the fragrance is, is just wonderful. And on the top right is um, witch hazel. And... You know, this is a picture of the Chinese witch hazel. Um, but anyway, there are some native witch hazels as well. The Asian ones are supposedly um, a little bit more fragrant, but witch hazel is another nice, clean, crisp winter scent. Uh, I would usually bloom kind of late winter. And then on the bottom is a picture of Edgeworthia. And Edgeworthia is another fragrant winter bloomer that's um, gaining in popularity. The next slide shows fragrant narcissus. And the one on the left is a favorite of ours. It's called Thalia. It is actually an heirloom narcissus, but very fragrant. And it's kind of late blooming. Um, it naturalizes very well. We just, we love Thalia. And the one on the right is Avalanche. Um, Avalanche is, is another heirloom, but there are a lot of fragrant narcissus. And usually if you are looking uh, in a catalog, in a bulk catalog, um, they will mention whether they're fragrant or not. Most narcissists are, not all. Some, some are, have not been bred for fragrance. They might have been bred more to be a show bulb. But just about all of the heirlooms are fragrant. And, you know, we do recommend looking for and planting the ones that are recommended for you know the deep south for the southeast 
and because they're going to perform and parentalize so much better for you. Um, this next slide, now I don't know what happened to, um, hold on, I don't know what happened to my other picture. Let me see. Let me see what happened. Nope. Well, I had two pictures of camellias, but anyway, um, we'll just go with this one. But the one that's showing there is a fragrant camellia, and it this one is high fragrance. Um, I also had a picture, I don't know where it's hiding or what I did with it, but we also had a picture of one called April Rose. And both of these camellias are um, relatively new introductions, and we're not that accustomed maybe to thinking about camellias having scent. And so when I do this presentation on heirloom fragrance, you know, heirloom fragrant plants and fragrant heirlooms, um, I don't talk about these camellias, but they're an heirloom somewhere, um, or their origins are, but a lot of the fragrant japonicas, um, well, they're not, they're a hybrid actually, they've been bred with luciensis, which is a camellia species, and you know, of course, camellias are Asian, but anyway, luciensis uh, is a species that often does have fragrance. High fragrance is one that we do have at Hills and Dales. We don't have it in the historic garden. We have, we have it in a container, one a specimen that's in a container, and we also have one at the visitor center because we don't just stick with heirlooms at our visitor center, and we have it, espalier, um, on the side of the building. And anyway, it smells wonderful. It's a late winter bloomer, maybe into very early spring, but typically for us, it, it's late winter. But, you know, being a late winter bloomer, a lot of times the buds escape a lot of the hardest cold, which is another reason that it might do well for you all in Cobb County. And April Rose is another later bloomer as well. And so, this, that's kind of a surprise as far as in the fragrant garden world because there again, like I said, we're not that accustomed to being able to um, have fragrant camellias. Although there are um, some japonicas that are reportedly fragrant, but you know, I, I just don't ever remember getting that much scent from camellias prior to, to sticking my nose in the high fragrance. Okay, the next slide, as we're going on into spring, shows deciduous magnolia on the left, and on the top right is winter daphne, and on the bottom right is winter honeysuckle, um, which I, I love its common name. And the common name that I learned it by was at the University of Georgia. I was not familiar with uh, winter honeysuckle. I grew up in extreme southwest Georgia, and of course, we, you know, very familiar with the invasive rogue hawks honeysuckle, and it just, you know, permeates the, the air with sweet fragrance down there, but nobody, you know, you don't want it because it runs over everything. But anyway, um, one of my favorite memories from the University of Georgia was a professor from there, and some of you may remember Dr. Tinga, but Dr. Jake Tinga was one of my major professors, and he would take us on plant walks. And this was, you know, before the rock stars got to the University of Georgia. This was pre Durr and pre Armitage. But anyway, Dr. Tingle would take us on plant walks. And he, we, we went walking by a large stand of this honeysuckle one winter day. It was in February. And it, it was in full bloom. And it just smelled like heaven. And he grabbed a blossom up and stuck it up to his nose and said, Ah, oh, sweet breath of spring. And I've never forgotten it. You know, there again is it, you know, I might, I don't remember what I had for breakfast, but I will never forget that story. I don't think even if I, if I do get a degenerative brain disease, I hope I never forget that story. But winter honeysuckle is a shrub. It's, you know, not terribly invasive. It's not a, a huge thing of beauty in its off season. So in my yard, I, I have a yard. I don't, I cannot claim to have a garden. I take care of a garden at Hills and Dales and you know, uh, uh, my landscape at home gets my leftover time, but I do have a winter honeysuckle and it's in the, the back of my yard and, you know, I can smell it whenever it's in bloom. And if it does try to suffer where I don't want it, I just, 
you know, I just cut it down. Um, and it's not, it's not nearly as obnoxious as, you know, Paul's honeysuckle or, any, or something like that. I just have to watch it for suffering a little bit. The, um, the saucer magnolias, of course, they don't need a whole lot of explanation, but they are a delightful scent. And there are a lot of them, most magnolias, you know, are purported to have kind of a lemony scent, but there is a variation. And of course the Daphne, the, the thing about Daphne, especially if you're guarding in zone seven, is it's gonna need a little bit of winter protection. And, you know, it, it needs to be sided well. Uh, I prefer to grow it in a container. That way I can have the perfect, give it the perfect drainage that it wants. And I can also wheel it in a little bit more protected spot. I wheel it in my garage, you know, if it's gonna get extremely cold to protect those um, flower buds. Because typically for us, they don't open usually until, you know, February is whenever they open down here. Okay, and fragrant early vines. Um, on the left, that's a that's a view of the part of the historic boxwood garden, the path called Magnolia Walk. And climbing up one of those magnolias is um, uh, Carolina Jessamine, and which is a native. Uh, on the upper right are uh, sweet peas. And on the bottom left is Clematis armandii. Now, the sweet peas, it's a good time to be talking about them because if you want sweet peas next year, um, I would recommend planting the seed around Thanksgiving. You know, putting, so you could go ahead and be purchasing your seed pretty soon and, and late November, plant them. And they will survive any cold that we have. Usually I will start coming up in the winter, but our cold does not phase them. One thing that I will mention about uh, the Carolina jessamine is that, um, and I'll mention this about a few things that are scented. Uh, Carolina jessamine, um, the Gelsimium sempervirens, has an evil twin. Uh, it has um, a very close lookalike, another native that is swamp jessamine, and it's very similar in appearance but it has no fragrance. And you know, I'm convinced that they're somewhat sold interchangeably in the trade. And, you know, whereas, you know, typically with planting plants, you know, we're advised uh, as horticulturists not to, um, maybe not to plant things in bloom or, you know, to plant them in the fall, which is a great time. But for scented plants, if you're buying plants for fragrance, there are quite a number of them that I would recommend that you know you buy them in bloom, try to you know pick them out in a nursery and smell them before you buy them so that you know that you are getting a, a scented plant. The Carolina jessamine and the swamp jasmine are, are that's one example where you know you may get its look alike that is not scented. So just you know, buyer beware and, and smell when you buy. Um, the Clematis armandii, uh, you know, it, it, it's evergreen. It's, it's pretty carefree. Um, you know, there again, the only, the only bugaboo that you have to really worry about with most Clematis is possibly Clematis wilt. And, um, you know, usually if you site them properly or you don't, you know, plant in a spot where you had a Clematis die before, uh, you should be okay. Um, Southern classics for spring. Um, I love Grancy Greybeard. Reminds me of my great grandmother, and you know the the look of it, the fragrance of it. And there again, you know, I, I associate Grancy Greybeard with my great grandmother that I you know had uh, from the time I was born, and you know she died whenever I was in my twenties. Um, and that's a plant that I associate with her. So there again, you know that memory um, with plants and someone dear to you. Um, it's a native. Um, two of these plants on this slide are natives, the Grancy Graybeard and then the, um, the Carolina Allspice, a short shrub, sweet shrub on the top right. And, you know, there again, another memory for me, that's my son's favorite plant. He loves sweet shrub, just the smell of it. And so I, I can't think about sweet shrub without thinking about my dear son. 
On the bottom right is banana shrub. And uh, banana shrub, you know, it's, it's an Asian plant. Of course, it smells to me not as much like the fruit of banana as much as it smells like banana candy. To me, it smells just like banana bite candy, the, the yellow banana taffy. Um, and it's a, it's a tender shrub. It's, you know, one of these southern classics, but what we have planted at Hills and Dales is, you know, we, we, we have lost some of the species due to extreme cold. And so we have replanted with um, the Skinneriana, the variety Skinneriana, which is a little bit more cold hardy. It, you know, is listed hardy through zone 7A. It can survive um, single digits, brief periods of single digits, uh, much better than just the straight species can. Uh, one other thing about banana shrub that I will complain a little bit about um, botanists, and this, this is uh, a, a classic reason why I'm a horticulturist and not a botanist because I just I have a wider worldview of things, and botanists just seem to key in on just to me, mindless minutia. <laughs> uh, whenever I started working at Hills and Dales, um, Violets had taken banana shrub out of the genus Magnolia and had put it into the genus Michelia, and now they've moved it back. It's now Magnolia again, but it was Magnolia fuscata, then they changed it to Michelia thigo, and now it's Magnolia Fico. So there you go. Um, it, you know, I, maybe it's just for the, uh, maybe it helps the book industry and with their reprints and they can, they can correct all their, their topographical errors or the botanical topographical errors. I don't know, but it's maddening to me whenever they change uh, genera, the names of these different genera, and then they switch them back. I just, I don't get it. But anyway. Skinneriana is one to make a note of if you want a banana shrub that's more cold hardy. And I would, I would recommend citing it. You know, there again, and this is a plant where a microclimate is very important. You know, you don't want to put it on the north side of your house. You know, if, you, if the north side is really exposed and it's going to get those blasting north winds, it's, you know, it's one that you want on, you know, maybe a southern exposure or against a masonry wall on the southern exposure or in a corner. Um, but just some place where it can have a little warmer microclimate if you want to use it in your garden. And it makes a great container plant as well. Um, you know, if you want to use it as a kind of a larger shrub in a big container and you can do the trick that we do with some of our bigger material and you can periodically um, take it out of the pot and root prune it during the winter and top prune it at the same time and keep it in a, in a container for quite a long time. Um, beckoning with beauty and scent on the left is a lilac and it's a um, it's a lilac that does very well in the south it's cut leaf lilac and um, it's syringa laciniata um, Alice Callaway had it planted now uh, it's you know these this is one of her one of the two that she had in the garden and it is fragrant it is not nearly as fragrant as Bulgaris. It is, um, you know, but it does have a very nice scent and it's a very different shrub. It's, you know, and it does very, very well in our hot climate. Um, and I don't know, you know, we're, we're a little bit further south than you are in Cobb County, so I don't know if you have much more success with growing um, Syringa Bulgaris, the common lilac. Um, a little bit north of Atlanta that you you all are, but we don't have terribly good luck with it where we are. I mean, it, it will deign to grow and bloom a little bit, but it, you know, doesn't really thrive. So a lot of people that have relocated to the South from, you know, cooler zones, colder zones from up North really miss life. And so this is one that is very heat tolerant, um, the cut leaf. On the top right is mock orange, Philadelphus coronaria, and it is another one that I would recommend buying in bloom. Um, we have a beautiful stand of Philadelphus in the church garden at Hills and Dales, 
and you know it was purchased as coronaria labeled as coronaria and it has absolutely no symptoms um and so the philadelphus does have but you know it's another one that i call having an evil twin and um there is a, a look-alike uh, that's philadelphus in odorous and in odorous is the specific epithet that means no scent in odorous no scent um it's common the inodorous is the one that's commonly called like in south georgia and south alabama they refer to this plant as english dogwood and i don't know if you've ever heard um a mock orange called or philadelphia's called english dogwood but usually they're referring to the philadelphia's inodorous and they're just about dead ringers for one another i mean it, it, as far as appearance wise it, there's just not hardly a nickel's worth of difference between the two but Coronarius is the one that has the lovely scent that's very much like citrus, like citrus blooms. So being that we got burned <laughs> uh, buying the, uh, the plant that we did it, we wanted the scent as well as the beauty. So there again, that's one that I would recommend buying in bloom and sticking your nose in it. On the bottom right is native azalea. And of course, native azaleas, you know, can be planted to uh, you know, to bloom anywhere from spring, from early spring on into summer, but not all of them are fragrant. Kind of like the, one of the very latest ones that blooms, the um, Rhododendron prunifolium, that you know is the um, the little bloom that is the logo, a stylized bloom. It's a logo for Callaway Gardens. It doesn't have any scent at all. And you know there are a few of the native azaleas that do not, but you know it's really easy to research which ones do. I will say that you know there, uh, there again, whenever you're whenever you're buying them, there's been so much hybridization that's gone on. Um, some of the newer hybrids are becoming more popular i think in the retail nursery trade than maybe you know some of the older species although they're you know they're still available but um it, with the hybridization there might be a little bit more variability uh you know depending on which parent you know it it got what trait from so you know i would certainly investigate if scent is what you want as well as the showy bloom, just make sure that you do your research and carry your nose to the nursery with you. But some of the species that are particularly fragrant are the Alabama azalea, Alabamaense, rooted in Alabamaense, the Australian, the Florida azalea, Australianum. Uh, sweet azalea is very fragrant. It's the arborescence. Uh, swamp azalea, which is a little later blooming, the viscosum is fragrant. So, um, Anyway, it's not hard to research and find out which ones are supposed to be fragrant. But, you know, there again, uh, just, you know, buyer beware whenever you buy them that, you know, hopefully you're getting the plant that, that you want. And it might be a good idea there again to, to buy them in person and, and, and smell of them because plant genetics can be highly variable like they are with humans. Okay, climbing on in spring. We have on the left uh, Confederate jasmine. So we're talking about vines here. And uh, Confederate jasmine, there again, is um, only reliably hardy through zone 7B. The cultivar Madison is supposed to be more cold tolerant. It's you know reportedly hardy through zone A. So Madison might be one that you want to purchase. And there again, with Confederate jasmine, ours you know, has frequently gotten killed back to the ground since i've been at hills and dales 25 years we've had it killed down to the ground several times and it's one of the largest plantings that we have is going on the south wall of the greenhouse so you know you know that that's a warm microclimate and we have even had it killed back there but it has always returned and um, you know with with plants that are a little tender if you can usually if you can get them through several winters and get that root system well established then it's going to be much much more likely to survive 
you know, an unusually cold winter than something that was just newly planted. So, you know, the, the goal is always to, to, you know, try to get something through a few winters. Uh, you typically, you know, it's our summers that we have to worry about. That's our toughest season. But, you know, the, the rub in that is when you're tender perennials or your tender shrubs, and that's when it's just the opposite. You want to get them through a few uh, winters so that they have a more established root system. Now, with climate change, who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll all be growing plants that only zone eight, nine, or 10 folks used to grow, but you know, I, I, I really don't want to see that happen. I kind of like uh, being uh, in the zone that we're supposed to be in, and I like being a temperate zone gardener. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, the upper right is a fragrant honeysuckle that is not a bad guy, and this is a gold flame honeysuckle, which isn't native, but it's also non invasive. And this is gold flame, and it's Lanicera. Hecaradia, gold flame is the, is the cultivar, and it's, you know, a hummingbird magnet, and it also adds some sweet scent to the air. And on the bottom right, if you've become disenchanted with Asian wisteria, with Chinese wisteria or Japanese wisteria, even though they have those magnificent showy blooms and they are very, very fragrant, we do have, of course, the American Wisteria, our native, it's Wisteria frutescens, and it's much better behaved, much less destructive to structures, um, doesn't, you know, doesn't sucker terribly, the seeds don't come up everywhere, and it is fragrant, maybe not as powerfully fragrant as the Asian species, but it will bloom, it will rebloom. Now it blooms after the foliage comes on, and the blooms aren't quite as large and showy um, as its Asian cousins, but it's a great, great native vine um, and I always like to say that um, Miss Alice had it she had you know wisteria frutescens growing in her garden way before it was cool um, you know whenever I started working here 25 years ago it was already well she probably had it at least 10 years then and I never even heard of wisteria frutescens uh, she taught me a lot and this garden has taught me a lot it's been a great teacher Sweet native trees. On the left is yellow wood, and we do have a yellow wood in the garden. Um, we, uh, we had one that Alice planted, and um, we did lose it. Um, it got um, some ambrosia beetles. It got uh, an infestation of the ambrosia beetle um, a few years ago, and we did lose it, but we have replaced it. We found um, a younger tree to replace it with, but um, Cladrastis Kentuckia is a beautiful native tree, and it does, you know, what does it look like? It looks like wisteria, and they're, they're kin to each other. They're both in the Fabiaceae family, so it has those white wisteria-like blooms, and it is fragrant. Um, it is, you know, a native tree. Um, it would probably do better for you all, slightly better, for you all than it, than it does for us. I don't think it particularly cares for the very heat of our summer, but you know, there again, we chose, we've tried to choose a site wisely where it gets, you know, some afternoon shade and we make sure that it, you know, we water it well during dry spells and, you know, it seems to be thriving. And the one that she planted thrived for quite a number of years before it, you know, it finally succumbed. And I, I don't think, I think that there was another the ambrosia beetle infestation was the result of something else going on with the tree, but I won't get into all that right now, but it's a great tree. Uh, and we found it locally. We found it, the replacement at a nursery in Fayetteville, a native plant nursery. On the top right is Sweet Bay Magnolia, Magnolia virginiana, and it, um, you know, has, the, has a smaller magnolia bloom. Um, Sweet Bay, uh, will grow in heavy wet soil. So, you know, if you have a, a spot that's, you know, kind of almost swampy like, uh, the Sweet Bay Magnolia would probably be happy there. And the bottom right, of course, are, is our classic Southern Magnolia that is kind of symbolic of the Deep South. 
a magnolia grandiflora. And, um, you know, our, our experience, Hills and Dales has lots of magnolias, lots and lots of southern magnolia. Um, the garden that we have here that predates the Civil War that was started by the Farrell family, um, the, the boxwood garden was actually planted underneath um, southern magnolia. You know, so they are the shade. They're the, the trees that are shading the garden that provide that necessary high shade for the, mag for the uh, boxwood. And uh, we call Southern Magnolias here at Hills and Dales job security um, because, you know, for many months out of the year, we're cleaning up something that they're dropping. Uh, so uh, we, we know that we will always have a job here at Hills and Dales as long as there are these towering, huge Southern Magnolias over the top of us. But when they bloom, you know, they bloom in May, which I always say is kind of God's apology uh, for their mess because during that same time period is when they're also dropping their leaves and putting on their new leaves. So uh, you have the, the sweet fragrance and those gorgeous blooms at the same time that they're raining down all of their old leaves. So anyway, gardening is, is not for the faint of heart or for the, um, uh, for the weak. Um, you know, we, it, it's, uh, it's hard, very hard work and uh, very rewarding, but very hard work. And, you know, the magnolia trees are, are beautiful, beautiful job security. One must have a few roses. Um, so you can't have a fragrant garden talk without talking about roses somewhere in there. And um, so these three are, are three that are really great roses. Two of them are climbers, but you don't have to have a climbing rose, of course, to have fragrance. But on um, the left is one of Miss Alice's favorites, and it's Madame Al Alfred Carrier. Um, just, a, just a beautiful heirloom rose that's highly fragrant. Um, in the middle is, and I'm, you know, pardon my French, but I, I you know, I'm not, I don't speak French that well. Um, but Zephyrine Drew rose and it's nearly thornless it will actually take a little bit of shade um and both of those roses all well, all three of these in the slide are even though all three of these could be considered heirlooms they they are all romantic or they all will rebloom and um, as i said the zephyrine will will actually take some shade and it's nearly thornless and on the right is um another favorite of alice's and a favorite of, of of every gardener at Hills and Dales and it's Pearl Door. Um, and it's a, it's a shrub rose. Um, it's also uh, become kind of a new trendy rose because it's a selection that's in the earth kind category. It's one of um, the roses that requires essentially no spraying. Uh, it does not suffer from black spot. And um, there might be, uh, every once in a while, we'll have a few uh, leaves that show up that may have some like shot hole in it. And, you know, people think, oh, well, it has something eaten on them. And no, that's usually an anthracnose, which is another fungal disease, but it's, it doesn't disfigure the rose. And, you know, we just, we just don't spray for the work. We um, uh, try not to spray any of our roses with anything uh, more potent than um, the potassium by carbonate as far as a fungicide. And most of the roses that we have, even if they get in the black spot, they'll just kind of shake it off. But Pearl Door stays clean and it, the, the little rosebuds, it looks very similar to um, Sweetheart Rose, Cecile Bruner, but it's a little bit more apricot in color. And it's a wonderful, wonderful rose. And of course, there are a lot. There are a ton of fragrant roses and you know every slide could be roses. And a lot of you know modern ones uh, very easy to research and, and find um, roses for fragrance. Most all of the David Austin series, I think just about every one of them is, is fragrant. Uh, but some have more fragrance than others. So there again, you know, you could ask other rose growers or, you know, Google search it or whatever. Or go to a, a nursery that has a good selection and sniff away. Um, as we get on into later summer or midsummer, um, these are a few things that you might consider. Now, on the left is night blooming jasmine. 
Cestrum Nocturnum. It's not a true jasmine and it's not hardy. Um, it's a little more, more tropical. So, you know, we have to grow it as a container plant. And, you know, the, the blooms are, are sweet, but, you know, they're, and actually they look a little showier in this picture than they actually are to me. They're a little bit more greeny chartreuse. But it's that night fragrance um, that is just, uh, it, it just, it, there's, it's hard to describe. It's just so heady and a wonderful fragrance. Um, anyway, it's one of the most fragrant plants that there, that there is, night bloom and jasmine. And there again, for someone that works all day and, you know, wants to come home and enjoy their garden in the evening, you know, you could have, I mean, you could just have a, container that has this jasmine on your patio and it's gonna you know send fragrance over over your entire backyard on the upper right is um gardenia or cape jasmine um there again there are some more cold hardy selections that are available um, of gardenia for people that are above uh zone 7b or 8a um, we don't have too much trouble growing gardenia here. Now we have had it kill down before, uh, seldom, but you know we have had it uh, get a little cold injured. Um, the um, dwarf gardenias, the gardenia radicans, uh, for us seem to be a little more cold tolerant, um, maybe because they're closer to the ground, but. Generally, when we've had any kind of gardenia injury, um, they've always, you know, grown out of it the subsequent year. Um, they've not lost gardenias, but there, but thanks to plant breeding, there are a number of more cold hardy varieties, and so, you know, that that are pretty readily available because everybody loves gardenias so much that you know some attention has gone into selection of for plants that will take a little bit more cold. And then of course your lilies, all the summer lilies. This one on the bottom is regal lily, lily on regal. And um, anyway, it's, it's just one of the many fragrant lilies. There's just so many. Um, you know, a lot of your, the uh, oriental lilies are all fragrant. Um, even day lily is fragrant. Uh, Every variety of daylily may not be as fragrant as some others, but the neat thing about daylily is that you can pick off the bloom and just put it in a bowl. You don't have to put it put it in water and have a bowl full of daylilies in your house, and and they're not so heavily scented. Some you know some things are scented so powerfully um, that you know I've even known people that you know couldn't stand the scent of easter lily or even you know some of the, the oriental lilies that it just was too much for them to get them a headache but they lily so much lighter and um a little less heady that it doesn't usually cause people as much of a problem sweet scented reseeders um on the left are four pots and now if you have an aversion to you know plants that reseed pretty heavily you, may, you might want, not want to use four o'clocks. Um, my mom has four o'clocks in North Florida and you know she just loved them. Mrs. Callaway loved them, Alice loved them, her grandkids loved them. And she would take blooms and kind of weave them together and make little, little flower necklaces for her grandkids whenever they were little. And so they you know, have really sweet memories of that. And of course, you know, four o'clocks get the name, that, the common name because they open late afternoon. And um, I don't know if they open exactly at four o'clock, but they're late afternoon and, and evening bloomers. And uh, reportedly used to be an outhouse plant. They were commonly planted by the steps, um, uh, you know, of an outhouse. And uh, more than likely to sort of mask maybe something malodorous that was coming from the outhouse. But um, a really sweet, um, charming plant and you know you will have to rogue out some seedlings so if you like i said if you don't want to do that then, then don't plant four o'clocks and it also forms a tuber and that so the original plant comes back as a perennial but you know we we don't mind roguing out a few extra four o'clocks here uh, flowering tobacco is another um 
plant that typically has a more intense fragrance at night. Um, and, you know, it's in the nightshade family. Um, they're not uh, nuisance receivers for us. We will get a few that will return, but, you know, not, not in tremendous numbers. But because they are related to, you know, tomatoes and tobacco, you know, it's flowering tobacco and um, does show that kinship that, that uh, is correct, that it is in the same family. So you might have to watch them for uh, tomato or tobacco hornworm. And on the bottom right is a, is a huge favorite of ours and it's old fashioned receding petunias. And these have been in the garden since, um, since the feral era, since you know, the mid 1800s. And we just have, we have some that just kind of appear randomly in the garden every year, just come up kind of where they want to. And Alice always pretty much let them just stay where they came up unless they were just you know, in the middle of the path or, or someplace that she really didn't want them. But they, there again, they don't come up in tremendous numbers. It's just kind of a, usually a sweet surprise to see where they're going to uh, present themselves from year to year. And the next slide shows fragrant summer herbs. And I know this talk's getting a little bit long, so I'm, I'm going to condense it. But, you know, uh, lots of herbs are certainly not all herbs, but lots of herbs are grown for their aromatic properties. And, you know, you know, plants like lavender, and then on the right, patchouli are just backbones of the perfume industry. And so, you know, what fragrant garden would be complete without having um, a few herbs? And on the left is lemon verbena, which is, of course, um, Scarlett O'Hara's mother's favorite, you know, her favorite fragrance. So, they're also a lot of fun to grow and introduce our children to um, plants that have scented leaves. Uh, the children that come to the garden are just enchanted with our herb garden and uh, picking off the leaves and smelling the leaves and they want to take the leaves with them. We have fifth graders that come and that, that's just one of their favorite parts is getting to uh, sample and smell and carry home some of the fragrant leaves from the herb garden. So it's just a great way to introduce your children to the magical world of plants and their, you know, their fragrance and their scent. Um, a summer surprise is, as far as fragrant plants, are crepe myrtles. Um, many people do not realize that there are some uh, fragrant crepe myrtles. So not all varieties are fragrant, but uh, the Natchez crepe myrtle on the left, and that that picture was taken in our courtyard. Natchez is a hybrid of uh, Legostromia indica and Faria, and the scent comes from uh, Faria. Uh, that species of crepe myrtle is well known for having some fragrance, kind of a lemony fragrance. And so many, many gardeners that have Natchez crepe myrtle in their gardens um, do swear that, you know, it does have a very, very nice fragrance. But the one in our garden that we uh, catch a whiff of the most is in the picture on the right, and that's Near East. And it is an indica. Um, and Near East is a baby pink bloom. It has a, a light fragrance, but it, it is very, it is definitely fragrant. It's this sweet floral scent. And the other nice thing about uh, Near East is it reliably reblooms. It blooms two times for us, uh, back to back. You don't have to do any kind of deadheading of the old prior bloom and it will grow, you know, will put out more buds and bloom quite heavily a second time. And ours are still blooming now, um, you know, from their second bloom. So, uh, and it's, I think it was introduced in the late 1800s. So it's not a new crepe myrtle, but it is available on the market near East. Uh, late summer whites, on the left we have tuberose. On the upper right is um, white ginger lily or butterfly lily, some people call it the uh, white ginger lily. Uh, usually it's blooming for us in August and into early September. 
Uh, tuberose is another one that intensifies at night. It's Mexican native, so it likes a you know a hot, dry location. Um, and on the bottom is you know another late summer lily, uh, the Formosa lily, Lilium formosanum. Um, another one that's very close kin is the Philippine lily. They're they're very very similar, and their fragrance also intensifies at night. Another thing with your white blooms too um, is that you know they kind of extend uh, the uh, visual appeal into the early evening. Uh, late like dusk and into the early evening hours. Um, they're again a boon for people that garden, that work, and then have to come home and enjoy their garden. The, the, you know, the white shows up, and if, it, if a plant's white and fragrant, you know, so much the better. More vines on the left is Poet's Jasmine. Um, it's not reliably hardy here in the ground. We keep it in a container. It was a favorite of Alice's. And it's, you know, Jasminum officinal um, or Jasminum grandiflorum officinal. You see it uh, written both ways. And there again, you know, it's uh, grown heavily for the perfume industry. It blooms in the summer. It's wonderful scent. Very easy to grow in a container. Um, on the upper right, it's and bean. And, you know, I, I'm, just in, I'm just in love with the uh, botanical name of hyacinth bean. It's... Uh, Dolicose Lab Lab, and I don't know what it is, but it's just so much fun to say Lab Lab to me. But um, I did keep it in here, although you know we we do grow hyacinth bean uh, pretty much every summer, and every site that I research for fragrant plants, you know, whenever I was first preparing this presentation years ago, you know, they were talking about hyacinth bean and how fragrant it was, and site after site and review after review and gardener after gardener talks about wonderful fragrance and we can't smell things. Our house at being every <laughs> I don't I don't know if it's maybe if we're not here late enough at night and we can't smell it. I left it in here but I'm just gonna make that disclaimer that it's gorgeous but we get nothing whenever we smell it. So I mean when we stick our nose in it. So you know if if you know exactly what hour of the day it's fragrant, please let me know. Um, the bottom right is Moonvine, and Moonvine is open at night, and it's, you know, most of your scented night flowers are heavily scented because they're trying to attract uh, insects that are out at night. You know, a lot of your night moths and that sort of thing, they're trying to attract the pollinator. I don't think they care much about us, but I like to think that, you know, uh, our gracious God in heaven, you know, also made them smell good for us humans too. Um, we're getting into fall now. So some heady fall aromas to the left is um, orange tea olive, which is a little heartier than just your regular sweet olive. And, um, you know, it has the, the orange blooms. On the upper right, instead of tea olive, because y'all are growing a little, little colder than us, I put um, Fortune's Olive, which is a hybrid between Osmanthus fragrance and Osmanthus um, heterophyllus. And heterophyllus is the hardiest species. Uh, most all, as far as I know, all Osmanthus have fragrant blooms. A lot of them bloom in the fall, and there are some spring bloomers. Um, and yeah, if, if there's a non-fragrant Osmanthus, I, I'm not, I don't know what it is. Uh, my, fra my favorite is, of course, the sweet olive or tea olive, Osmanthus fragrance, but it is a little tender, so it would need protection, but, you know, it blooms fall, some in the winter and some in the spring for us, but the heterophyllus is a, and the uh, Aurantiacus are, are both good subs, you know, if you have to worry about, you know, something being a little, a little too tender for where you garden. And the fall surprise is um, there are some fragrant societies. And I'll let you all do the, the research. There's quite a number. And I do have a handout that I can email to, um, to Lisa or to someone else if she wants to, to email that out to you all that lists uh, all these plants. And of course, this is not an exhaustive uh, presentation. There are many, many more fragrant plants that, that I can fit into this time frame because I'm already, you know, have gap for too long, but I will um, email that out so that she can distribute that to you all um, if you would like. This 
quite Sasanqua is um, Setsugeka. I think it's Kamuya Sasanqua, Setsugeka. And there again, it is a, uh, I think it's a mid-season fall, uh, fall bloom. And then uh, now at the end of the year, we've come full circle. And so this slide is fragrance beyond flowers. Don't forget your foliage that can be fragrant. Um, we talked about herbs a few minutes ago, but you know, these are some of your um, a couple of conifers that are real fragrant that are great to cut and bring into your house for Christmas. Um, you know, the, that woodsy resinous, resinous scent that um, conifers bring and, you know, make your house smell so good over the holidays. On the left, oh, excuse me, on the left is um, Carolina Sapphire, which is an Arizona Cypress. Uh, I'm not going to make a big long spiel about Arizona Cypress, but the botanists have gone and taken it out of the, uh, uh, cy the Cypress genus and have put it in a another genus. But anyway, that's just another uh, mad soapbox issue for me. But Carolina sa Sapphire is beautiful. We don't have that many uh, nice blue uh, conifers that we can grow in the deep south and this is one that you know will take our heat. On the upper right is a bay, a bay laurel, um, Laurus nobilis and um, I, I did keep this in here even though um, laurel, bay laurel, bay leaf is you know this is where we get bay leaves from. It's typically hardy only through zone eight but um, Nurseries Carolini Ana sells a cultivar called Chuck's Select. And uh, Ted Stevens, who, who owns Nurseries Carolini Ana, says that um, Chuck's Select survived um, minus four degrees. And he said it killed down, but it, but it grew back from the ground. So I put that in there so that if y'all are interested in growing bay leaf, and it also does very well in a container as well. Um, but if you're interested in growing bay leaf in the ground, you might want to check out Chuck's Select. And on the lower right is our native eastern red cedar, uh, Juniperus virginiana, which um, you know smells wonderful and has the you know the nice berries, makes a great wreath plant as you know uh, wreath greenery, as does the uh, Carolina sapphire as well. And then the uh, final slide is another quote from Walt Whitman. Give me odorous at sunrise, a garden of beautiful flowers where I can walk undisturbed. And um, that concludes my talk. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching and please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.